Welcome to the phase one webinar series for June 2019. Uh, my name is Dana Brown. I'm the sales director for our phase one industrial. Today's webinar, we have two special guests from Air Data Solutions. That's Don Cummings and Kirk DeMuth. We're going to get to see how um, their company started, who they are, uh, where they're going, and how the phase one has taken them to increase their capacity in the agriculture market and open up other opportunities in other markets as well. But before we introduce them to go through that presentation, um, I'll do a brief overview of our corporate and product, which maybe many of you have seen, and thank you for coming back to seeing this series as well. And then once we finish that uh, corporate overview, we'll have Air Data Solutions present, and then we'll do a Q&A. So if there's any questions that you have during this presentation, whether it's on the corporate product overview side, or if it's on some of the questions specific for Air Data Solutions and how they're using phase one cameras, you can type in a message on the box and Paula Cooper will be um, taking those questions at the end and then sharing those with the group that we have here on this webinar and either myself or Air Data Solutions can answer those questions for you. So let me go ahead and begin with the corporate side. I'm sure many of you that have seen these webinar series have seen these same slides. I'll try to just hit key points so we're getting through this portion of it and then we can move on to the the Air Data Solutions presentations. So for those of you who don't know who Phase One is, <clears throat> we are a leading provider for medium format digital imaging. I'm gonna focus on our core. Our core is the medium format sensor. Our strengths is the innovation from the hardware software side to deliver best in class solutions, whether it's from aerial mapping, acquisition, machine vision, and others, as you will see. We have a worldwide centers of excellence, Japan, Denmark, Israel. We have sales offices on almost every continent. So we do have worldwide coverage from a support standpoint and distribution standpoint as well. The key thing that I'm gonna focus on or just talk briefly about on this slide is customer centric at the very bottom. We have the innovation, but we leverage that innovation for the customers that call up and say, can you add this enhancement? Can you change this product to do this? And typically it's specific for a particular vertical market like in agriculture or transportation or environmental or energy. So we really um, do a good job of converting your requests into enhancing our products to again, deliver that best in class product. Now from the technology side, as, we, as I said before, we deliver solutions and components. We are not a one sensor fits all company, but we have sensors that start at 50 megapixel for UAV type applications and move all the way up the gamut to 190 megapixel for large format area coverage for mapping. So we have purpose built sensors, components and systems for your applications. On the operational edge, again, you'll see a key message here on each one of these slides, again, focusing on innovation. We have a very innovative central technology, shutter technology that our cameras now can support up to half a million activations under warranty. And to extend that even more, we offer a premium warranty program, which takes that half a million activation to unlimited activations because the premium warranty program will cover um, that, that shutter replacement. Oh, too many slides forward, here we go. Okay, so many of you are already familiar with our camera line. I'm gonna very briefly go over these this slide here that talk about the these different products and as they fit to different types of platforms and applications. Today we're gonna to have a presentation that focuses on the IXU series camera. That's what Air Data Solutions uses in a four band configuration. But we also have the 1900, which is an IXU uh, camera base, and that's 190 megapixel, as I mentioned before, 
for more of a large area coverage for mapping. The next one, almost in the center, a little bit to the right, is the IXM camera. This is a purpose-built UAV camera. This was released over a year ago. And this camera, again, is purpose-built for the UAV industry, flying at 400 feet or lower with four different choices of lenses based on mapping or inspection. Now, this same camera has been and is used in oblique systems as well. So it's a very popular camera. In fact, the IXM100, the 100 megapixel, has been the um, one of our best moving products in the UAV industry for mapping and inspections this year. It's been a very, very successful tool for a lot of different service providers. And then last is the IXMRS, the far right. This now comes available since last year in the 150 megapixel version. Again, giving you more area coverage, better resolution, and this also comes in an achromatic and or four band configuration in addition to the RGB. Now, it doesn't stop there from phase one because now we have aerial systems that have the component of the camera itself, as well as a stabilized mount and the GNSS IMU with controller and phase one software that plan your missions, capture the imagery and uh, trigger the camera based on your flight lines. So a complete aerial capture system is now available. And again, these are purpose built for specific, whether it's low flying Cessnas, single cameras or four bands cameras or high flying with the 190 covering a large area. There's quite a, a varied configuration on accuracy as well from the GNSS IMU. If you have any questions on the aerial systems, feel free to type those in on the message or you can contact us later uh, through our website. Now we're going through the transition slide of this presentation where from the product perspective, seeing the cameras, the systems. Now, where do these fall into place when it comes to the different markets? And so these are the different vertical markets that we see our solutions and our sensors being used. Traditional photogrammetry and mapping and GIS. Agriculture, which you're gonna see more about today. Oblique imagery, 3D city modeling, and also LiDAR manufacturers will use our sensors then accompanied with um, their LiDAR sensor as well. So quite a gamut of different market uh, applications. If there's one on here that you don't see that you're in and you'd like to know more about, please contact us. We'd be glad to see how our camera and or our systems can fit and make you more efficient in your, in your job. So this is the point where I'm turning it over to Mr. Don Cummins and Mr. Kirk DeMuth from Air Data Solutions. Uh, I would like to welcome you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to present to um, this uh, this webinar. Thank you, Dana. This is Don Cummins, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're excited to be able to share with you some of the applications that we've been using the uh, IXU 1004 in the in the past year, and also talk about. Um, some of the applications that we've used aerial imagery for in the past uh, as it regards to agriculture. So um, a quick background, Air Data Solutions was founded in 2015. Our uh, background of the, the founders of the company was in agriculture. So we kind of started with what we knew. Um, I spent about 20 years raising cattle and uh, growing grass and um, we we kind of fell into the to the aerial side of of, uh, of data collection through uh, another provider who who did some aerial work on our farm and when we saw the results we decided that this was something that we wanted to get into so um, it started right there on our home farm and it just grew into uh, uh, a service and then uh, eventually into a company so um, we've been collecting imagery over over farms, um, timber, waterways, oil and gas, uh, a lot of different industries now for several years, but it all started in agriculture and that's still kind of the foundation and the, the building blocks of, of our company. So um, who, who are we? We are uh, a team of about 15 employees 
Um, we're located in six states. Our backgrounds are in ag, uh, research, aviation, and defense. And um, we currently operate out of uh, central Louisiana. Um, we have an office in Texas. Uh, Kirk DeMuth, who, who you'll be hearing from in just a couple minutes, is in Colorado. And um, we have uh, offices in California and, and West Virginia. So we kind of scale across the U.S. and um, we deploy pretty much anywhere that's needed. And uh, next we'll <clears throat> let Kirk introduce himself and talk about um, some of the platforms that we use to perform our, our data collection. Thank you, Don. Hello, everyone. My name is Kirk DeMuth. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Air Data Solutions. A little bit about my background, kind of similar to what Don has as well. Uh, my background's in agriculture and aviation. I grew up on an 8,000 acre farm ranch operation in Southwest Kansas, uh, still actively involved in that operation today. Uh, I have degrees in aviation and business management. I have a commercial a pilot certificate uh, as well as a certified flight instructor certificate with over about 3,000 hours logged to date. Um, I started out my career in aviation. I was a former chase pilot for the U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force Predator and Reaper um, unmanned aircraft programs. So I provided uh, any escort services that they needed through civilian airspace when they were doing training uh, ops with those aircraft. So that was kind of my first introduction to unmanned aircraft. Um, from there, I went to be the UAS program manager at Kansas State University. I uh, worked there for a number of years, uh, developed a training and curriculum for the UAS degree program that they now offer, um, and went through the full process of Board of Regents approval for that program and curriculum. Um, I also provided uh, flight operations and, and hardware for various agricultural research projects within the university under their agronomy department. Um, about six years ago, I founded and was the chief operating officer of a company called RoboFlight Systems, where we designed and manufactured a purpose-built aircraft for uh, agricultural data collection. Um, and then we uh, later purchased a company called AgPixel and changed our name to that, and we were an agricultural imagery processing company. Um, so from there, uh, within the last year, I joined the Air Data Solutions team as a chief operating officer, and currently head up the Raptor UAS data collection division of our company. So on this slide here, you will see in the upper left corner, that is a fixed wing. Um, it's called a fixed wing because it's a traditional airfoil. Um, UAS, or unmanned aerial system, drone, UAV, uh, there's a lot of different terminology out there for these aircraft. They're all pretty much the same thing. UAS stands for Unmanned Aircraft System. Um, the system is not just the aircraft, it's the cameras, it's the ground uh, equipment, the radio modems, the computers, the controllers, everything that is required to actually make that aircraft fly. So that's kind of more of the politically correct term is Unmanned Aerial System, but kind of the common term <laughs> nowadays is drone. Um, but we don't care what you call them. They all do the same thing. Um, so you'll see here within our fleet, that's one of our aircraft. It's a fixed wing design, as I said. Uh, just below that, you'll see a multi-rotor. This one has four motors on it, so it's considered a quadcopter. Uh, we also have six rotor versions that are called hexacopters. Um, but uh, many different terms, but all kind of essentially the same functionality. This one takes off vertically. Uh, and lands vertically, so it hovers kind of like a traditional helicopter, and then it can fly, you know, fully autonomous flight grids to do mapping missions. And we can put a various number of payloads on there, different sensor configurations for whatever the mission may be, whether it be thermal data collection, uh, agricultural color infrared imagery, or standard RGB imagery. Um, and then in the upper right corner, you'll see a hybrid of those two versions. It's called a VTOL Savant. And VTOL is just an acronym. It stands for Vertical Takeoff and Landing. So with this aircraft, it basically combined the better attributes of both designs into one system. So it can do the very confined space operations of the vertical takeoff and landing. But once it gets at a safe altitude, it transitions to the, the longer endurance or more efficient fixed wing uh, flight. 
uh, that aircraft can fly for about an hour and a half and it can carry up to about a seven and a half pound payload. Um, so that is a look at our UAS fleet. Um, we, we operate these aircraft for uh, smaller missions. Typically uh, with these aircraft, uh, you can see the, the multi-rotor design there. That one only flies for about 20 to 30 minutes maximum um, and, and less with, with more cameras on it. So that aircraft is optimized to cover uh, smaller areas. So it's, it's really optimized for doing like agricultural research or doing uh, monitoring of test plots. So that aircraft can cover roughly about 100 acres a day efficiently at ultra high spatial resolution. Um, it's it's really good at capturing that, that high resolution data, but also generates a lot of imagery to have to process after the fact. So it's a balance of, of collecting the, the optimum resolution for the application that you need uh, and not generating too much imagery that's going to take weeks to process on the back end. Um, so that's kind of the limitation on the, the multi-rotors. The fixed wings can fly uh, much longer, so they're more, more endurance. Um, but they, they still have a limitation of about a thousand acres in a day, and that's at roughly a one inch or two and a half centimeter resolution at that. So anything larger than that, which we do, uh, majority of our operations are larger than that as far as our project that, that we complete. So that requires us to move beyond the unmanned aerial systems and into, uh, you can go to the next slide, Dana, our manned aircraft system. So I'll let Don take back over here. He, He's the one that kind of heads up this division of our company. So I'll let him explain our different assets there and some of the camera systems we use with our man fleet. Thank you, Kirk. So uh, I'm on the screen now is uh, three of our manned platforms and uh, just a little bit of background. The blue and white airplane on the right was the aircraft that we started with and it carries a very small format uh, DSLR camera system. It, um, it's very efficient and um, does the job that it's intended for. Um, the camera is mounted internally uh, through a hole in the, in the floor and the subfloor of the aircraft. Um, we've operated that airplane for about five years, predominantly over agriculture uh, lands. And so in 2018, we actually um, integrated the phase one IQRS 1000 into a uh, Cessna 206 aircraft in the middle. And the reason for doing that was we, we were putting several hundred hours a year on these aircraft and um, we're feeling somewhat limited in the amount of area that we could cover. So by adding the, um, the larger system, we were actually able to not only double, but in some cases um, triple or quadruple our productivity and still maintain uh, a high level of res spatial resolution in our imagery and increase our accuracy um, through the uh, Planix IMU and the, uh, the, the gimbal. So the next slide um, shows the integration in that 206. And this was done in August of 2018. And one of the uh, interesting side notes of that integration process was I was, um, while I was familiar with imagery systems, um, this one was a, a whole new animal. And phase one sent a representative uh, to meet us at our airport. And within uh, about eight hours of, of setup time, we were actually had the system integrated and, and were flying and collecting data. And the first mission went off without a hitch. So the integration was ex extremely uh, quick and I would say simple because I had an expert there installing, um, but once he, once he demonstrated that process, we've been able to uh, insert and remove the system without any trouble. So the reliability has been excellent. The integration is, is pretty straightforward, and it's, it's been an excellent system to operate ever since. So next slide. And in addition to um, the IXQRS 1000, we do operate some other sensors that, uh, depending on the project type, they, uh, they, they work well um, alongside to collect additional data. So one of those is a hyperspectral sensor, which will actually be flying tomorrow and the next day over some cotton 
uh, down in Texas. And um, one of our limitations with the with the previous system was if we wanted to shoot uh, uh, RGB as well as uh, color infrared or any other type of sensor, thermal or, or hyperspectral, we'd have to remove one camera, stick the next one in, and then go fly the field again. Um, but now with this setup, we're able to collect four bands, um, and in the aircraft that is operated, we can we can also mount additional cameras. So it really improves our operating efficiency a lot. Next slide, please. Uh, where do we operate? Um, like I said before, we go pretty much anywhere. Um, we we also utilize a, a, a network of operators that we train and support, and they're depicted on the screen by the blue circles, and the yellow circles are where we have our aircraft assets. So predominantly based in the southeast uh, Gulf Coast region, um, but we have the ability to reach out to these other operators who we know can provide consistent data collection products for us uh, all across the United States. Next slide, please. And um, this is just a, a depiction map showing some of the states that we operated in the last couple of years. Um, in 2018, we mapped about 1.2 million acres for 57 different clients, uh, 12 states and four countries. Next slide, please. So now we'll get into some of the agriculture applications. And before we talk about what some of our focus points are, I'd like for Kirk to give a little bit of background of what is precision ag, uh, how does it work, and why are we utilizing cameras uh, in conjunction with these precision ag equipment that the producers are using. Thank you, Don. Uh, so with my background that I mentioned, uh, growing up on a farm and being actively involved, uh, my family currently utilizes um, John Deere equipment. Um, everyone has their color, but that's their particular color equipment that they, they use. And I know for about the last eight years, they've had the equipment um, that has the modern day precision ag technology. So for the purposes of this presentation, uh, precision ag equipment is any agricultural equipment with the capability to apply inputs at a variable rate based off of spatial data provided to a computer on board that equipment or it's commonly referred to as a controller and this controller takes into account the implement swap with uh, the gps position of the 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 implement the speed and then the different rate zones that are provided via a map in the form of a prescription um, so this information is fed into that controller and this allows the operators to apply a variable rate. So that means a higher rate on some areas, medium rate in others, and a lower rate on, on other areas um, as it's going through the field. And you'll see you know, from the, the image there, the graphic that we have on this slide, the very top one, there's red, green, and yellow um, polygons within that boundary. That's essentially what the variable rate management zones look like on a prescription map. And you can see these are irregular polygons. So if you had, say, 30-foot implement going uh, on a grid through that field, por portions of that implement would be entering into a, you know, one rate zone, while the other portion of it may be in a different rate zone. So this computer controller will adjust based off its capability to do so. Some implements can adjust every few feet. Some can adjust every nozzle or injector, whatever the application may be. There, there is a little variance there. And some can only adjust based off the swap width of the implement. So that spatial pres prescription that we're inputting into the controller has to be custom built essentially for the type of applicator being used. But this controller will adjust based off its ability to do so while it's going through that field and, and entering into one zone and, and then into the next adjust those rates for each section of the equipment that it can control. So this allows growers to input the fertilizer, nutrients, or whatever it may be that the, the field needs at a more specific uh, target location based off the spatial layers that we provide from our, our imagery. So this optimizes the money spent on inputs, which you know in a modern day ag economy, you know, the margins are very tight. So optimizing your inputs 
is something that every grower needs to be able to do in order to you know, be able to, to make any kind of margin on, on any of their operations. So this is what we refer to as precision ag equipment. It can be, you can go on the next slide, please. It can be anything from an aerial applicator aircraft. Um, they have systems that can do variable rate and, and actually adjust you know, as it's moving along each swap. Um, this can be in the form of, of whether it be liquid um, as a pesticide or herbicide, or even you know a dry application of fertilizer and uh, you know a slider on a gate that's adjusting the rate as the aircraft's moving and that aircraft's moving very fast along that swap so this controller has to keep up very quickly and mm -hmm. this is an application that Air Data Solutions has built prescriptions for in the past and then you can see here on the right um, that's more of a traditional ground rig that's a, a John Deere sprayer and within that uh, piece of equipment there is a controller that can adjust different sections of that boom um, that is applying the the application or the input and from there this prescription that we build automatically goes in there so that the operator doesn't have to adjust any of these rates manually they just load the prescription the rates are in there based off the different zones that we've delineated and the controller does all the work so it's very high tech but very user friendly and easy from the operator's perspective Okay, you can go to the next slide. So how do we feed this modern day ag equipment with the information it needs to know what rate goes where? So we do so in the form of color infrared imagery that we collect, and that's what we can do with our phase one system. We collect visible colored bands, um, which are red, green, and blue, as well as a infrared band or near infrared band. Um, and from this, we can compute what's a very old equation, but it's called NDVI, and that stands for Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And that equation basically will tell us where in the field we have a higher or lower chlorophyll density. And it's all relative to within the boundary that we're surveying. So if we have plants that are more stressed, they're going to show up as red and if we have strand plants that are they're less stressed they're going to show up as green and then anything in between is going to be more in the yellow pixel ranges so when we run our color infrared imagery through this ndvi formula we produce these ndvi values on a scale of 0 to 255 255 being the highest and 0 being the lowest and we split that scale within the number of color palettes that we're using but in this instance here you see we use red green and yellow so we basically split that into thirds and anything in the bottom third is going to be your red pixels anything in the middle third is going to be your yellow and anything in the top third is going to be your green so these different colored pixels can essentially become our different delineated zones in that field and we can make these zones more pixelated or more coarse based off of the applicator that's going to be applying the input for those zones so the more fine that the applicator can apply the inputs, the, the more fine the pixel or the, the spacing, the grids are going to be as far as um, area that we are going to delineate as a management zone. So this variable rate equipment technology or precision ag technology has been around on uh, this ag equipment for, I'd say, about the last 10 years. And a lot of it's been underutilized because there really hasn't been a cost-effective means to feed that equipment with the spatial data that I just explained. So a lot of your, your growers today that have more of your modern day equipment already have this capability, but they are underutilizing it. And that's where we really have found a solution to that gap from the technology to what their capabilities are with the equipment they have. So we help them get more out of what they already have an investment in. Okay, next slide. All right, so moving on to applications, I'm gonna turn this back over to Don. And I know we're kind of running short on time here, so we'll try to speed through this as quickly as possible. Okay, so um, next we have a, a, a few slides that demonstrate some of the applications that we've used the imagery for. Um, number one is uh, identifying wind damaged corn or any kind of uh, uh, environmentally damaged crop. 
So you can see in the color infrared and how it corresponds to the NEVI imagery, it, it, it indicates very well where there is an issue with the crop, which also helps uh, insurance adjusters or farmers make quick decisions on the, the total amount of area affected. And if it's uh, an instance where they, they need to take some kind of action or um, delineate acres that need to be adjusted uh, according to insurance. So um, this is a, a very quick way to get answers on the extent of damage in your field. Next slide. Identification of weeds. And some instances where we are able to uh, take high enough resolution imagery that we can identify uh, spectral differences between the actual uh, desired crop and weeds that are in the field. And uh, we often take this a step farther, um, delivering the imagery um, and, th and then analyzing it and creating um, some kind of report that shows how much, uh, where they are, and um, helps make the decision of what to do about them. So in this field, this was rice. It was a uh, very young rice. You can see a lot of bare soil under it. And the uh, area circled on the color infrared uh, image is weeds that was actually um, from a crop plant of the year before the opposite direction. So we took that imagery and classified it in, into three zones. Um, the, the blue on the right is the bare soil, the green is the rice, and then the magenta was the weeds. And in this case, they wanted to come in and, and spray uh, some herbicide and kill the weeds, but they didn't want to cover the whole field. So it, it uh, was a, a good application to help save the farmer some, some time and money on uh, applying a chemical across the entire field. Next, next slide. <clears throat> Herbicide drift, this comes up a lot and for different reasons. Sometimes it's a, it's a mistake, sometimes it's the environmental conditions. Whatever it is, if there's a drift complaint, um, the traditional procedure is to go uh, stand at the edge of the field on, on the top of the pickup truck and look out and estimate the extent of the damage. But um, with the aerial imagery, you can usually get a, a much better assessment of the extent um, and the total area covered. So this was uh, sugar cane in South Louisiana. They uh, they were burning down neighboring fields with Roundup and it drifted onto the, the growing sugar cane. We actually had the chance to meet up with the, the guy who did the insurance claim on this field a year later because we, we flew this. The client was the producer. Um, I run into the the claim adjuster about a year later and was showing him this imagery, not knowing that he, he adjusted that field. And he said, oh yeah, I know that field and, and you're spot on. Your your assessment was was very accurate. So a um, little bit of added um, accreditation to um, what we were able to detect here. Next slide. This was a uh, actually a variable rate seeding prescription that we did last week on some rice. There was also a uh, there was a, a drift issue that killed some of the rice in the field. Um, the producer called and asked if we could um, image it and then build a prescription to allow them to send a plane over and apply uh, apply rice seed only in the areas where it needed it. So the inset image on the right is the actual prescription built for an 802 air tractor. With equipped with a variable rate um, dry hopper made by Bondren, and the green areas are where the uh, the rice seed was dropped at a rate of um, I believe it was 70 pounds per acre. Um, the red areas they did not reseed. So um, you'll notice on this prescription map that it's very blocky and they're long rectangles, and this is intentional. Um, we uh, custom build this per aircraft based on the swath width for the particular material. And then we uh, that would be the narrow side of the rectangle. Uh, this one was 55 feet wide. And then the long side would be 150 feet long because as per mentioned, is the fast as the airplane is traveling, um, you don't want the rate to change uh, too much for a particular period. Otherwise, the gate's just constantly moving and it can't keep up. So um, that's an example of a seeding prescription. Next slide. Vari variable rate PICS application. Um, PICS is a plant growth regulator. 
applied to cotton. And cotton is a very growthy vegetative plant. If it grows too fast, then it doesn't produce as much cotton. It just gets more growthy and more stems. So they have to reduce its growth rate, but the fields don't always grow evenly. So the, the, the PIX chemical is very cheap. We don't save the producers any money, but what we do is help them uh, increase the uniformity of the stand. So if it's uh, a small, uh, not so growthy part of the field, you don't want to uh, you don't want to knock it back by applying too much of this plant growth regulator. But if it's a a really growthy area of the field, it does need to be slowed down. So that's what this uh, prescription is indicating. The red areas were basically areas that had poor drainage early in the year, so the cotton um, <clears throat> did not do as well. So we didn't apply any plant growth regulator there. The green areas got a lot. That was the, the more growthy areas. So it really improves the uniformity of the stand by applying a variable rate application across the field. Next slide. And um, then a variable rate fertilizer application. So this was a, a corn field. It um, had a lot of uh, groundwork done to it, le land leveling the year prior and so the corn is very uneven you can go to the next slide that's some ground photos of the corn showing the differences in it so um, the goal was to push some of the small corn and um, to not do anything to some of the more growthy corn that was that was performing better next slide if any of you have worked uh, in agriculture for farmers, you know that time's of the essence. So the quicker you can turn around a data product into something usable, the better. Um, so this is just a real quick summary of, of the turnaround of this project. Day one, the color infrared imagery was flown, three and a half inch resolution. Um, these are the actual flight lines and image locations. Day two was um, the NDVI map was created and sent to the producer and their agronomist to review. Day, th day two, they went to the field and, um, and, and correlated the imagery to the field. Day three, they recommended how many zones and the rates to apply in each zone, and we created a prescription map for that. <coughs> and then day four, on the next slide, was what we, <coughs> what we actually sent to the aircraft to to apply um, and then we we created a, a check map as well so that they could adjust the rates um, per load and fine-tune the uh, the aircraft gate settings uh, next slide <clears throat> this was a as applied map that was created by the air tractor <clears throat> the green areas are where the gate was open fertilizer is being applied and then the gaps are where it was shut and it, it does correspond to the prescription map. So this was a double check to, to show that it was it was putting out the fertilizer where it was needed. The uh, the pilot said that the material used was within 99% of what was estimated to be used. So they were able to tune it in very closely. And the customer response, as Kirk has mentioned before, tough commodity prices, it allowed us to put inputs exactly where they need to, to go. Um, this year, actually about a month ago, we did the exact same thing on the exact same field. So he was very happy with the results. And next slide. So um, <clears throat> those applications we've been performing for years, what does a phase one system do for us that our old system did not? Here's a, this is not the same image, but the image on the right is was taken with the, the phase one camera three inch resolution uh, a couple weeks ago the image on the left was taken with our our older system you can see the the fidelity you can you can tell the the crispness the uh the dynamic range of the image imagery is just so much better and then that's not to talk about the actual coverage area so the the phase one imagery is is much better than what we were collecting before um, so if we can cover more area efficiently and get better imagery, then the system pays for itself. And that's what it's shown us that it can do. Next slide. And this is the uh, a zoom in portion of, this, of the image on the right, <coughs> showing some of the detail of uh, some, some cash crops in the, in the field. 
and then uh, just some sample imagery of beans on the left, corn on the right, and vegetables in the middle. And if you hit it again, it'll show the achromatic uh, imagery that was taken alongside of it. So the IXU-1000 um, collects uh, the imagery with both cameras' heads, and then it rectifies those images together. So you have a, a perfectly aligned achromatic uh, image that corresponds with RGB image. And how does this increase our efficiency? Well, you saw the slide before of the imagery taken over that cornfield with all of about 500 images. It took them approximately two hours to fly that field. Um, the bottom right is the exact same field, exact same um, over, side overlap and forward overlap with the uh, IXU-1000 at even better resolution, three inch versus 3.5. It's only five flight lines. It would take approximately 15 minutes to fly this field. So the uh, productivity is extremely increased. You have less images to process and the job can be accomplished a lot quicker. And here's an example of uh, phase one imagery and then a color infrared image from, from our old system as well, just as a comparison. And uh, I know we're running short on time. Um, we have just a couple more slides here and I'll let Kirk talk about yield prediction. And then Dana, if, um, if we need to wrap it up, just let us know. Okay. Thanks, Don. Uh, so you'll see on this slide, this was an application uh, that we did where we flew a field approximately 41 days prior to harvest. And we were trying to come up with a yield estimation um, so that we could see how closely we could do that from an NDVI image prior to actual harvest with a uh, combine that had a precision uh, yield monitor installed on it that would give us a very precise uh, map of the field after it was harvested to see how we uh, compared. So the imagery you see there on the top, that was flown. And then we went and did ground samples where you can see the photos there, the different areas. We, we took a sample from the green areas, the yellow areas, and the red areas. And on the ground, you could obviously see the difference in the size of the corn ears. Uh, we did the calculations to in those different areas to do an estimate at that location of what the yield would be based off what we were seeing, counting the kernels per year and the plants per acre. We ran the formula and came up with three different levels of yield. So in the higher area, we were showing 192 bushels, the medium areas 185 bushels an acre, and then the, the red areas were 140 bushels an acre. So quite a difference in those different locations, but from the map, we were able to delineate those uh, the area within those different color zones. Um, so you can see there in the bottom right corner, those are the different uh, areas of the different uh, delineated zones. And so we did the, the calculation, divided it by the acres, and we basically came up with a predicted yield of 183 bushels an acre. Uh, so 41 days later, when we actually harvested the field um, from the scale tickets and the combine yield monitor report, the field did 186.11 bushels an acre. So we were in 2% or less than 2% of accuracy or, or of error, I should say, on that estimation with using NDVI imagery, and we did it over a month uh, before the field was harvested. Next slide. So here is an example side by side, uh, that same NDVI image that we flew on August uh, 17th, and then you can see the harvest yield map on uh, September 27th. So the image on the right is actually from the combine yield monitor, you see it looks a little more pixelated because of the swap width of the, the uh, corn head that was used to cut it. Um, but you can see the color zones line up very, very closely. So, and there's a summary there of the, the error that we achieved on this project. So with this, we did this, not just on this one field, this is the one we used for case study, but we did this on six fields at the same time and they all yielded less than a 2% error. So we kind of proved that this NDVI technology is very useful in doing uh, yield forecasting. And you'll see here on this next slide, uh, Don actually performed this project, so I'll let him talk it a little more, but this was a yield forecasting project that we performed um, in coordination with NASA and Texas A&M University 
on a rice field in Texas. Don, I'll let you take it from there. Okay, so uh, just real quick, we the, the goal here was to scale up this capability of, of predicting yield across different crops. And that's why NASA and A&M got involved. So um, this slide and the next slide um, talks a little bit about the scalability model, where we go from UAVs to manned aircraft to satellite imagery and for the intent of, of producing yield prediction models on a large scale. Um, so uh, go ahead and switch to the next slide. The scalability is really where the, um, the phase one system helps us to perform. Um, and that's, that's the goal of our operation is to be able to scale across uh, much larger areas. So we kind of start ground level we we fine tune our uh, our methods and accuracies and then we scale it up and um the the phase one has has proven to be um exactly what we expected it to do um and allowing us to scale in, in those ways um the next few slides uh depart from agriculture work and it, it's just some examples of some of the other industries that we operate in now um this this map was uh taken about two weeks ago. It was uh, 130,000 acres flown at 12 inch resolution and approximately one hour. So uh, just to give an idea of, of how much area you can you can cover with that system. <clears throat> and we produce custom GIS solutions. Uh, next slide, please. And um, we're able to deliver those to the client um, in, in a format that they can visualize all their data and utilize it as necessary. And next slide is, is uh, just basically a, a snapshot of, of many of our company offerings and different ways that, that we collect data and, and provide it to our clients. And that's about it. So um, we appreciate you listening in. We're, well, we're uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, we thank you for your time and allowing us to be a part of this. Well, Don and Kirk, thank you very much. This was extremely informative uh, for me. I hope it was informative for our listeners as well. So thank you for taking the time of putting this together and sharing the benefits and the efficiencies you've gained in your business from um, uh, adding the phase one uh, four band system to your tool sets to collect data. So Paula, I'm going to just turn it over to you to see if there are any questions or if we've run out of time and it's best to communicate that via email, please uh, let us know. I think everything's been covered perfectly uh, because there's not many questions. There was just, um, there was one that mentioned, um, I think is about the product offering, is the four band version offered in the 190 megapixel? Yes, so we have four band availability from the 100 megapixel, the 150 megapixel, and the 190 megapixel uh, in the four band offering. In fact, I think one of the images um, on one of the slides previously that we saw um, did have 190 with the fourth band on there as well. So the answer is yes, we do offer that. No, I think, I think that's it. Um, there's no other questions there that have come in. It's all been covered perfectly. So. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining this webinar series. If you have some questions that come up later, as usually happens to me when I'm on a webinar, I think about it 20 minutes later, um, feel free to email me. It's dbr, that's D for Dana, B is Brown, R and Randy, dbr at phase1.com, or just go to our website and go to the inquiry page and type in your question there and we'll get it answered for you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Kirk. We really appreciate your participation in this. Everybody have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you, Dana. Thank you.